Welcome to the Linux Spotlight. This show is dedicated to showing off the best thing about Linux, our community. This community is made up of developers, distro maintainers, YouTubers, and everyday users. Each one plays a vital role in our community. And the goal is to have a discussion with each individual about their journey into Linux and beyond. So join me now as we turn the spotlight on. Hello, I'm your host, Rocco, and with me today, our special guest is Mark Shuttleworth. Mark, how are you? Rocco, it's a pleasure to be on your show. I am so excited to get to talk to you, dude. Um, you obviously don't need an introduction. I mean, your list of titles, entrepreneur, philanthropist, founder of companies, space traveler, uh, you have even a former Debian maintainer, which I didn't realize. Um, but everybody sees all of those things because it's in the public eye. But who is Mark Shuttleworth personally? Well, that's, just, that's an interesting question. I think uh, I'm a gardener. I like to see things grow. And I'm an explorer. I like to figure out uh, what's possible to get to places that that haven't been explored. And I'm a scientist. I, I like to figure out what's true and what's going to work. And it's even you know more exciting to do that when when truth is obscured, right? When it's uncertain. That's who I am. Awesome. Well, you do so much that is open to everybody. And I'm not exactly sure how you make time for everything that you're involved with, but you said about uh, you're a gardener. Is that the time you make to get away? Is that one of your hobbies that you do? Uh, it is a hobby. Um, I, I'm very lucky. My my mom uh, was a gardener, and so she, uh, you know, as as both punishment and reward, she would get me into the garden uh, growing up. And uh, as a young as a young adult, I kind of moved to the big city, and after a couple of years, realized that that's what I was missing. Um, and today, um, you know, in the places where where I where I live and work. I invest in gardens for the future, right? I invest in spaces that I enjoy, but that ultimately other people do enjoy and, and will enjoy. They get used for sort of for, for, for public purposes. Um, and it's a deeply satisfying thing to see um, uh, nature do its thing. Spaces get formed, you know, you, you turn you turn dairy fields into forests and clearings and meadows and things like that. Uh, it's nice to do something that doesn't send me email. And it's <laughs> it's nice to do something that I can't, you know, even think about speeding up. You know what I mean? There's no there's no equation there where you can say, Oh, we could grow this forest faster, right? It's yep. it's just gonna grow at the speed that it's gonna grow at. So for all of those reasons, you know, it's a, it's a very satisfying sideline interest in what's otherwise a very kind of digital world. Yep. There are no shortcuts. Um, I had a garden for a few years. It is very, it feels very good to be close to, close to nature, close to the ground. And yet, I wasn't very successful at it. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yes, I, I am also not, if, it's, if it were just me, then it would be a bit dire, to be honest. I, I have lots of other people that are attracted to the work. So, you know, I get to bounce ideas around and, and then make suggestions and then it gets done. Um, but I have managed to keep an orchid alive for a couple of years. And so I, things are improving on the sort of personal gardening front. Yeah. Nice. All right, so you gave a TEDx talk, I believe in 2014, and I watched this. It's entitled uh, Future Within Our Reach, and I think that it's still relevant today. In this talk, you mentioned a list of famous people that didn't come from places you would expect. They came from varying circumstances, varying backgrounds, uh, places you might not have ever heard of. And you made a point of how 
coming from these backgrounds grows your character. Mm. Uh, you grew up in Cape Town. Can you talk about your circumstances that affected and grew your character? Sure. So, you know, in a sense, I, I'm a very fortunate person, right? I grew up middle class, but in a country where there are many people who are very poor, right? So uh, a very privileged existence, even though amongst our community, it was absolutely middle class, right? Mom's a teacher who stayed at home to uh, get the kids sorted out. And dad is a doctor, right? So um, not a particularly commercial sort of family environment or not a particularly business oriented family environment. Uh, and far away from the epicenter of technology, growing up like like many people that you would have had on the show, I guess I was I was interested in technology and, and would get access to magazines and and books in the library and try to sort of understand it all. But Cape Town felt, you know, miles away. It was miles away from um, Acorn and the BBC Micro. It was miles away from the IBM PC. It was mile, miles away from Cupertino and, and Silicon Valley. So you really felt like, um, in a sense, that, you know, you could only aspire to being a, a spectator or a, a follower. But open source changed that, really. Open source sort of that my immediate sort of feeling on encountering open source was that the stuff that could literally craft the future was now suddenly in my hands, right? And it was in my hands just a few minutes after it was in the hands of everybody else. The internet wasn't very fast in Cape Town, but that didn't matter. You could still be part of the discussion and part of the, the leading edge of everything. So, so Cape Town was a lovely place to grow up, but it was also the sort of place where you might assume you couldn't take a proactive, play a proactive role in, in shaping what's possible. And the, the point of my talk there was that one should never make that assumption, right? That if you have the heart and the head and the will, you, you, you can be part of any, any breakthrough team in the world that you want to be. And you can be, you, you can set the pace effectively um, in the stuff that you're interested in. Yep. And I think that's why it's still relevant today, that you can pretty much do anything if you set your mind to it. In 2002, uh, you became the first South African to travel to space. You spent eight days on the International Space Station for research. And in order to participate in this, you underwent a year of training and preparation. And you were quoted as saying, an experience like that changes your perspective on life and the world. Can you talk about the preparation and maybe the emotional preparation on how that trip changed you? Sure. The thing I would want to convey to people is that you have to imagine being in a foreign place on your own where you don't speak the language and it's completely unclear how you're going to achieve what you've set out to achieve. You know, I, I, I literally got on a plane and went to Moscow. There was, a, there was a guy who said he could introduce me to some people, but that was it. And so, you know, you have to start essentially imagining yourself going back to your hotel every night and not knowing if, if this is going anywhere, if, it, if it's going to work, if you're potentially being ripped off, uh, you know, you're, you're in an environment of just complete uncertainty and you have to figure out who's who in the zoo and who you can trust and who you can work with. And through that sort of walk, walking that path, you ultimately build friendships uh, with people who are, you know, medical professionals who look after cosmonauts and scientists and engineers and people who make rockets. And, in, and over the course of a year, you get yourself trained, qualified, um, assigned to a crew, you, you know, tested, uh, and ultimately given the opportunity of a lifetime to, to be on that flight. And that experience, that, that feeling of going somewhere, knowing that there's something possible, but not knowing how you're going to do it, not knowing if it's going to work, not knowing, um, <laughs> you know, just how how badly it could work out um 
that same feeling has been true of most of the sort of big things that I've been privileged to do, right? There's always a sense of going on your own. There's always a sense of being in a completely foreign environment of one form or another, right? Um, uh, there's always a sense of fear because of the uncertainty and because of the, uh, you know, the risk of one form or another. But it's by being willing to go put yourself in that environment that you get to the top of the mountain, right? Or you get to the space station. Um, not guaranteed, but it's certainly guaranteed that if you're unwilling to put yourself in that position of uncertainty, you know, then then you're limiting what's possible for you. Right. Well, I can't imagine what it is, what it's like out there. But what were your thoughts about that? What I mean, what were you what were you thinking when you first made it to the space station? Well, I was quite relieved when when we got to sort of main engine cut off and separation, and nothing had gone dramatically wrong. You know, it's a, <laughs> that's a plus. <laughs> it's it's quite an intense eight minutes on your way on your way to orbit. I had some things that were that uh, that I had to take care of. You know, during the during the the insertion maneuver, as they call it, which is which is getting to orbit. And so, you know, I was quite I was quite focused on those. But you can't help but notice that you know you've you've got. Uh, all sorts of explosive devices going off around you and and lots of lots of dynamic and dramatic sort of moments so yeah when we when we when we separated from the rocket and you suddenly find yourself in orbit and you have a minute to kind of breathe it's it's just it's a sort of stunning feeling right you you really are there um and the whole the whole of being in space is sort of this odd combination of intensely domestic i mean you you're, you're it's a bit like a camping trip with, you know, five other great people where you're eating canned food and cleaning the toilet, you know, and you have all of those sort of basic domestic things that you have to do. And yet at the same time, if you, if you stop to look out the window, you know, there's, there's a planet, right? Right. That's amazing, dude. I can't imagine it and I would love to do it someday, but probably never will happen because most of us will never get that opportunity but i'm i'm happy for you that you did we're right on the cusp i think i think you know there will be a generation not too far away that you know commutes to australia that way because it's just the best way to do it right you know um so i do think we're on the cusp of of the true era of space right mass access to space and i hope that for other people for people for whom it is sort of a daily experience or a regular experience, that it, they don't lose that sense of wonder at the earth from a distance, right? It, it, the, the, cha the shift in perspective that I think people who get there the way I did have is that borders disappear, the nature of the earth and, and our impact on the earth becomes super transparent. You know, you can't con yourself when you're looking at it all. Right there, it is, and 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 our mistakes are writ large on the face of it. Right, so I hope that as as more people do get access to space, that they're also motivated to think more globally when 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 they're on the ground. Right? Yep. Well, we have to get into Linux, but I think we need to start at the maybe the beginning of where your computing started. So, what was the first computer? That you used? I had a, a Commodore VIC 20 with a tape drive <laughs> as, a, as a young kid, and then a BBC Micro, uh, which was really the first the, the machine that I kind of grew up with. That was, that was the one that I dug into and started to sort of really feel like I could understand, you know, what, what it was doing. Right. So you then go off to school, get other computers. How's that progression work? Um, almost, almost all of my school computing was at that level of the BBC, which was a which was an educational computer primarily, right? It was, it was the, you know, it was the, I guess, the social precursor to the Raspberry Pi, right? There's there's almost a direct line that you can draw from from the BBC Micro to the Raspberry Pi. So it wasn't particularly powerful, and it didn't ultimately sort of define mainstream computing. But it was a very transparent machine. You you you, you could really understand uh, what it was doing. 
it was a great a great platform for learning um, and then from there I, I moved to uh, pretty directly to university where they were just going through the transition from a netware type environment in the labs to a windows type environment but but very quickly, um, I discovered Linux and secretly converted some of the machines that I had access to to Linux. Um, <laughs> and, you know, one of those sort of perhaps better to ask forgiveness than permission type situations. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's where I really started to, you know, dig under the hood and, and, and yep. get in touch with it. Yeah. What was the first distro that you tried? Slackware, yeah. Uh, a classmate of mine showed up with a pile of three and a half inch disks and uh, said that you know he'd spent the weekend installing it and that I should give it a go. And so that evening, I had a key to the, one of the computer labs and I set myself the goal of basically installing Linux on one of the machines uh, and then reinstalling windows so that by morning nobody nobody would know that i'd done it <laughs> and for a while that was that's what i used to do uh, do a very rapid install play around and then and then cover my tracks so uh i just uh, I, I guess hacking uh, but i didn't feel too bad about it it was uh it led to i wouldn't feel thing. bad about it I usually ask people if they have ever uh installed Linux on any like uh box store computers like Best Buy or Micro Center or something like that. But you actually went through with it at the <laughs> there. So that's awesome. Yeah, I'll never forget one one night at about two o'clock in the morning, I'd gone up to the lab and I that sort of bootstrapped Linux on on this box and was digging into it. And uh I'd taken a beer up with me and sort of to my horror the door opened and a professor walked in. And, you know, he didn't, whether he didn't notice or, or what, but he, you know, he didn't seem to notice that I not, was not running Windows. And he didn't seem to mind that I was there at two o'clock in the morning, but he, he, he reminded me quite pointedly about the no drinking in the labs. <laughs> right. No liquids in the labs <laughs> at all. <laughs> so uh, I thought I was done for, but uh, it all worked out okay. That's, that's pretty awesome. You end up becoming a... Debian maintainer. Uh, how did you get started with Debian and coding in general? So that was while I was at university. Um, I was studying software engineering and finance. So I was doing a sort of double double header. They ended up kicking me out of the out of the software engineering course because they said, you know, it was a bad idea to have somebody doing two and uh, maybe maybe sneaking into the labs overnight had something to do with that. As yeah, well. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I, I'd studied software engineering, and I was I was into Linux, and I was quite active in trying to get um, as a student in trying to get local operations on on the internet. I I got the the local newspaper on the internet. It was the first the South African operation of the of the, the independent newspaper group was the first of all of their global newspapers to be online. I, I led that, so I was quite active with the internet and and. And Linux as a way to kind of basically make the internet work. Right. Uh, Slackware was an amazing starting point. The dependency management ideas in Dpackage uh, and then later Apt just seemed like exactly the right approach. So I so I signed up to to Debian and they didn't have a, a package of the Apache web server. So I made one, and that's that's how I became a DD. And then Debian formed, you know, just a fantastic platform for what I wanted to do after university. So I, um, I built Thought, uh, which is a cryptography and, and certificate company, um, entirely on Debian uh, and with Linux, which is why when that all wrapped up, I, I felt like I, I owed it to the open source community broadly to to help other people benefit from open source more easily. Right? It, it it had been possible, but it was it was quite difficult in those days to to really get your hands on Linux and and make the most of it. 
And so that was sort of the the DNA um, ultimately of Ubuntu. Um, I didn't I didn't do that immediately because honestly I thought other people would do it. Um, in the late '90s, it seemed that Linux was was on a tear and would just keep getting better, and that I I wouldn't need to to, to make that a focus. And it seemed that Debian, you know, was just because the, the approach was so much more suitable for what open source could be, you know, I just thought that everybody would move that way. And so I, I didn't immediately dive in and, and, and make that a priority. I did some other projects and, and, you know, various other things. But over time, I started to understand why, you know, you know what, that, that in a sense, Linux was, was going in a direction that suited large businesses, um, but wasn't, I thought going to really address the potential for something that could could make a difference in the lives of of everybody, and so that then it became clear that that since nobody else was going to do that, I should have a go, and, and that that led to Ubuntu. Right. So then you in March of two thousand four, you started Canonical, and the first bug report was a bug called Microsoft has a majority market share. Can you talk about that? <laughs> On the desktop, yeah. Yeah. Well, so the, the, before that, I, I was kind of thinking about, you know, whether I should do this. And at some level, I knew that it was kind of commercial suicide, right? There were, there were established Linux companies, and most markets don't allow for more than two players. Most markets like this don't really allow for more than two players, you know. SQL databases. There's not much after Oracle and SQL Server, right? Right. Um, mobile operating systems. There's not much after iOS and Android, right? So <laughs> there's a there's a whitewater rafting company in Zimbabwe uh, that goes down the Zambezi River, and there's one there's one stretch where they don't they don't take people on that. That rapid is called commercial suicide. You know what I mean? If you <laughs> if you take someone down that, you're 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 it's commercial suicide, right? And I and I remember thinking, you know, as much as I feel like somebody should try to make Linux for everybody, it is going to be commercial suicide. And I, I was really nervous about doing it because, you know, I, you know, it was just going to be difficult. I knew that. Right. So I, I had planned to go down to Antarctica and I used the trip down to Antarctica to kind of read as much as I could about the things that I thought were going to be important. And it was on that sort of trip, reading a lot of Debian mailing lists, other mailing lists from different open source communities that I kind of formulated the, the initial approach and, and started to identify people to bring in to what would become canonical effectively. Right. But, but I, was, I was, you know, in the same way that showing up in Moscow with no real idea of whether it was possible you know, gives you a sort of sick feeling in your stomach. I, I remember feeling exactly the same way on that ship down and back, right? It wasn't the seasickness. <laughs> it was just the sort of yawning uncertainty of whether it would be possible at all, right, in a world which is already pretty well defined to, to do it differently. Yep. Well, uh, branding is a big deal in companies, and you chose the name Canonical. What was the importance of this name? Well, so two words, right? Canonical as as the company name, and Ubuntu as the project name. So Ubuntu for Africans is a very well known word, right? It, it it means a sense of the benefit to all of us of treating people well, right? The idea that y y it benefits it benefits you. It's part of who you are, how you treat other people, and. For me, that captures a lot of, of what happens in open source. You know, some people will sometimes say, you know, that what I've done is particularly amazing, but I am much more flawed by the thousands and thousands and thousands of other people who make contributions of their work in various ways and forms. Some people get all ideological about, you know, which contributions are better than others, right? But I think that tends to lead to a four legs good, you know, two legs better type yep. type attitude. I'm just genuinely amazed and delighted that we live in a world where, in fact, the slack 
and the generosity and the intellect of tens, hundreds of thousands of people can become a shared set of tools that everybody can build on, right? I just think that's a wonderful world. And so Ubuntu as a word kind of reflects that for me. And I want Ubuntu as a product and as a community to to reflect what's really going on in open source, right? It's easy to focus on the the brands and the names, the, the the ringleaders. What they do is awesome, but there is something bigger going on than than that. And then canonical. Canonical means essentially the textbook way to do something. And and I w- I wanted to build a, a a company where my colleagues would have a hunger for doing things the right way. Right now, that's not to say that we haven't screwed up occasionally, but it is a real privilege to work with people who share that particular view, uh, and so that that's why canonical. All right. So, um, are you going to let us in on the secret sauce on what goes into the names of each release? Because you you chose to do a specific setup for releases with the naming convention, so. You gonna let us in on the secret sauce of how the names are chosen and why? Um, so, well, I'll tell you where that started. I got back from Antarctica and started emailing various folks from the open source community that I thought had the right mix um, of heart and head, and and convinced twenty odd people to get together in London, and we started whiteboarding. You know what we could do, and that was in that was in March, April, two thousand and four. And we had said we were going to do a six-month release following GNOME, which was the first open source project to do that. And that put us on schedule to, to put out a, an entire distro in October, which I think everybody in the room was good enough to know was a stretch. And someone said, well, it can't be perfect. And so I said, well, let's, let's nickname it the Warty Warthog. And so uh, the Warty Warthog became the code name for the first release. Uh, it also became sort of like an internal term of endearment for people at Canonical, so we are the Warthogs. And once that was behind us, we needed a code name for the next release, right? And so that that pattern was established. And um, the, I usually caucus around and about a couple of people for the animal. And there are a couple of community wiki pages where where people sort of speculate as to what might be good names, and those are a good source for me. So I, I do I do check those out. Uh, and then I spend an afternoon trawling through <laughs> trawling through a, a dictionary app, which lets me sort of filter and search down for adjectives and and find something that feels right. Nice, I love it. All right, so ever since that first one, you have been releasing versions i hate to ask you this uh but do you have a favorite version that ubuntu released the precise pangolin was one of those where i sort of felt like lots of good things came together bionic was one of those ones where it was it was formed at a really tough time and i thought both the community and the canonical people who did it did a masterful job of it. So I was, I was really happy with that one. And I'm very, very excited about Focal 2004. I, I think there's a bunch of stuff upstream that is cooked really, really well. And there are a bunch of things that we've been sort of evolving inside Ubuntu that are now really mature. So it feels like it's going to be a, a great platform for the next five years for everybody who who wants to build important stuff i think there has been nothing but positive comments on people who have tested out 2004 i've tested the daily images out myself and i am so excited for the release of it so yeah nothing but good things it um it's always a bit nerve-wracking because with that many users of course there's lots of edge cases and, and corner cases and so it, it looks like a wall of bug reports. You know what I mean? Like the reality is it looks like a lot of things wrong, <laughs> but it does have a good sort of, 
it does feel like it's got good bones. And the fact that we're, we're now sort of in the final stretches of it with this global, the global challenge of coronavirus in the background, you know, adds adds another sort of layer to everything. And it's just kind of incredible to me how much people have managed to retain focus and how much head and heart uh, is going into this this last sort of three weeks before uh, before the release candidate. Yep. Well, back in 2011, October 31st, you made an announcement that excited so many different people about the goal of the Ubuntu phone. And to this day, people are still looking for a mainstream Linux phone other than Android. At a certain point, you had to shift resources away from Unity as a desktop and turn away from the goal of the phone. How hard of a decision was, was that for you to make? And can you tell us about the importance and the reasons behind why you did that? Hmm. Um, well, it was gutting. I, I loved the vision of the convergence of personal computing. And, you know, I'm still excited today to see how the players who are in that race continue to sort of pursue that, right? The latest round of iThings, you know, tablet, laptop, phone, you see them all converging. And I, I think, I feel somewhat proud that, that you know, we, we did plant the flag and try to attract open source talent to that to that vision and somewhat chastened that we failed right that that i wasn't able to pull it off uh, it was a very very tough decision there were a couple of hard things in going on one was that it was getting very very expensive to build ubuntu and i needed to focus the team's attention on the things which would ultimately allow us to you know as you start to get more users, you start to get more work because people want more from the platform, which is right. Uh, but we didn't have a model at the time whereby we could we could you know share that cost with the user base. So we needed to get that right. Today, three four years later, Ubuntu is a much better platform because we have a lot of customers. And what I what I realized was that trying to build the, the mobile experience at the same time as trying to get the cloud and the IoT and the enterprise stories right was spreading was spreading our best people too thin. So that was one sort of forcing function. Another hard forcing function was the realization that the ecosystem walls had come down. You know, it, we. we if we went to talk to a phone manufacturer, they'd say, well, are you going to have WhatsApp? And we go and talk to WhatsApp and they'd say, well, maybe, but not for a year or two. And then I realized that if it wasn't WhatsApp, it was going to be the next one, right? That at the end, the world only needs two. And if you aren't bringing something fundamentally different to the table, then if you aren't one of those two, you know, it's, it's tickets. And then there was a, a darker realization, which was that the quality of the engineering in it wasn't good enough. You know, I, I loved everybody who was working on it. I loved that we were working on it. But, but I'm also ultimately of the view that, you, sh, you know, your merit matters. And it doesn't matter how noble the cause or correct the vision. If in the end it isn't good enough, then it's not going to work. And I thought we'd made a lot of mistakes in the building of it. We were trying to go too fast. We were thin, thin and we weren't being tough enough on ourselves around the sorts of choices that we're making. And so all of those things ultimately led to, to the decision. I love that other people have continued to evolve. UB ports has continued to evolve and experiment with that code base. I love that. Um, I love that there are other open source efforts, groups that, that, that want you know, to make uh, a free software phone experience. Yep. I think, you know, Every generation, there is a fundamental change in the form factor, and that is always presents an opportunity to come in and and put a new vision forward. And I hope that free software, you know, whoever's leading the the you know free software forces, when that when that next opportunity comes, does a better job of it than I did. Right, that, that in the next wave, maybe 
you know, free software will define the experience. I, I would say that when that day comes in the community, even if it isn't yet clear that it's possible or that it's a good idea, we should give people a latitude to do that, right? To go do crazy things uh, and have ambitious goals. One of the sort of difficult things about that effort, the, that Ubuntu phone effort, was that it became very cool to hate on unity. Uh, and there were definitely things where criticism of unity was warranted, but it was sort of astonishing how, how to the extent to which there was sort of a pitchforks and torches experience. You know, it was sort of deeply unpleasant for a lot of people who, who were trying to get it right. And so that, that is the one thing that I would like to see changed, right? Is that we, we, you may not agree with what people are doing in open source, but you don't have to contribute to that. And the fact that they want to try is sort of a wonder, right? There are lots of things happening in open source that I think might be dead ends, right? Um, but I try very hard to encourage them, people to follow, you know, the pole star, because, you know, one day we may, we may, we may count on that, right? Yep. Uh, none of us can see every aspect of the future. We should let people encourage people to drive stuff if they're doing it as as free software, even if we don't necessarily get it or agree with it. Well, that is well said because there are so many people out there. Like the, the Linux community is changing for the better over the years. Um, we have grown to the point where you see a lot more community effort. You see a lot more uh, combining efforts. But I think you'll always have those people that will never be satisfied no matter what you do. And I think that the best thing is to just be an example of not being that way. Well, yes, I think I think there will always be people, you know, who who want to try to lead things, and there will all, always be people who want to try and tear them down. That that doesn't surprise me. What 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 surprised me a little bit was where the quiet majority came out in the middle. You know what I mean? That it's a lot easier to to say nothing, um, and 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 if you do that, then you really you're allowing the trolls to have much more airtime than than they deserve, right? Yep. Anyhow, we live and learn. I I um, I think you should always try to do things that might fail, right? <laughs> and occasionally you succeed at that. <laughs> yep. Always. Um, so, you know, you have seen Canonical do so many different things, successes, failures, regardless of what people think about it. You have seen them go from rebounding to be a successful company. Is there something that you're most proud of that holds a special place in your heart? I'm most proud of the way many, many people have stepped up to lead things. And that's true of people who don't work for Canonical, but who essentially take advantage of the of the of the of the icebreaker function that we perform you know we go break a bunch of ice and there's a lot that can happen around us and, and behind us that 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 is wonderful and requires leadership and and I and I find that inspiring and inside canonical um, you know for a for a small organization to be in the game of complex operating systems we need a lot of diverse leadership and the tough times that we went through four or five years ago um, provided, you know, almost like a, an evolutionary bottleneck. You know, there was a lot that didn't survive at that time. And, and what I'm really proud of is how a, a quite a wide variety of people have stepped up to, to carry real responsibility and, and to do things that millions and millions of people benefit from who, who, who don't necessarily, you know, understand you know, where that thing came from uh, or what it took. Yeah, how much and I'm, effort I'm it took. I'm super proud of, of my companions and colleagues in this effort for the way they carry that, right? 
it's um, it's a real privilege. Yep. Well, Mark, I have so many more questions, but time gets away from us and uh, we have things to do. I do want to thank you personally, because since 2004, every one of us has been able to enjoy a new version of Ubuntu every six months. Um, I want to thank you for your personal contributions to Linux because they are immeasurable. There's a lot of people who look at Canonical for what they didn't accomplish. And I have always posed the question, you know, what would our world look like without Canonical, the Linux world? What would it look like without the efforts of all of the people in Canonical? And yes, Linux would still be here, but I think it would be open source software would still be here, but I think it would be a different landscape. And on a personal level, I can say that I probably wouldn't be on Linux and it wouldn't have stayed with Linux had not had it not been for Ubuntu and it being easy to install Linux. And for that, I am really grateful. Well, it's, um, it's, it's my pleasure to have been uh, part of, of unlocking, you know, the passion and the competence of, of all of the thousands of people that it takes to make that happen. It's, 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 uh, it's a big effort for many people. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about is, is that open source allows us to sort of take what's worked in the past and then open up new kinds of compute, right? So we tried to do that on the phone and, and weren't successful. Um, but, but where I think we, we are going to be successful is in the next wave of appliances. You know, I, I did a scan of my home network and I have 80 something IP addresses assigned to various things. Who would have thought, right? Yep. You can't buy a speaker or a TV or a light bulb without assigning an IP address, right, these days. And I think there's an incredible amount of creativity to be unlocked in all of that. And there is also a real duty of care and responsibility around security and provenance and trustworthiness in all of that, right? And I'd really like to see free software define the best practice there. Right. So one of the things that I'm very excited about in, in 2004 is that in the same way that we have a collection of free software desktop experiences led by communities that are passionate about GNOME or KDE or XFC or, or um, uh, LXQT or, you know, any, any of the the diverse desktop environments. I think the next wave will be appliance experiences, right? Free software routers, free software home automation, free software media centers, free software home hubs of various forms, um, energy controllers, lighting controllers. The upstream communities are there. Um, and, and what I'm excited about in 2004 is to give them a, a, a stage and a spotlight in the same way that we've given different desktop environments a stage and a spotlight, right? So that they can have their own appliance experience that they define that benefits from the shared work that the Ubuntu community does on security and integration and, and documentation and so on, but which is ultimately theirs, right? An expression of, of what they do. So start your Raspberry Pi engines or your upsquared engines <laughs> um, and you can, you can count in, in April on there being some really interesting secure order updating entirely free software appliance experiences to uh, to which you can nobly assign some IP addresses in your home and feel good about it. Nice. I love it. I can't wait. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate your time. 
It was a pleasure. Thanks for what you do. All right. That's going to wrap it up. Thank you all for joining us this week as we spotlight the best thing about Linux, our community. Until next time, long live Linux.